a small, tidy crowd because I think I explained to some of you earlier, uh, the invite that's for the event is only going to Master's Scholars. So, no. If you don't have one and you came anyway, not to worry, uh, please stay and, and take what you can from this. Uh, however, the initial invitation went to those of you who are holding an Ontario Graduate Scholarship or a Canada Graduate Scholarship at the Master's level. And this particular event is designed to give you some information from some experts on how to prepare for the next level of competition, which is the doctoral competition, depending on which uh, field of research you're involved in. So my name is Paula, and I manage the financial support portfolio, and my expertise comes in the external funding, and I am the Tri-Agency Scholarship Liaison Officer for Western. So we're going to concentrate on the CIHR and CERT and SHRC doctoral scholarship competitions that are coming up. I'm going to give you an overview of timelines, deadlines, application, and resources. This slide deck will go up on our website under the Preparing for Competition page. Uh, where the register here link appears, that will disappear and re be replaced by a presentation link. So that's your, your go-to page to access this information. This first slide, when you see it, it has links to our own SGPS pages for each of these funding opportunities. And I'm going to actually visit each of these links as I go through. The CIHR Doctoral Scholarships competition closes first. Nationally, it closes on October 4th this year. At Western, we're going to close it on September 4th so that we can convene our CIHR Doctoral Scholarship Review uh, Committee and they will, they're tasked with going through all of the applications submitted into ResearchNet and reviewing them for feedback for correction and revisions, okay? So just to show you where this takes you, there, it takes you to our own website. There's value, timeline, and deadlines, application, eligibility, and it's also got links in there to the federal agency site. Same for the doctoral uh, scholarships, NSERC doctoral scholarships. That's the next competition to close. Uh, the deadlines that you need to follow, the only deadline that you need to follow is your application deadline. And these vary across the university by graduate program. They will all close anytime between very late September and late October because the university deadlines for graduate programs to submit their ranked and recommended applications is November 1st. So you're going to be wanting to get started now and get, get going on the, preparing the components of your application so that uh, you will meet your graduate program deadline. That deadline will be set by your graduate program. You can contact your graduate program coordinator or graduate chair if in doubt. And the same for the Shirk Doctoral Scholarships. It's the last competition to close in the fall. Uh, we will be closing it on November 11th for graduate programs. But again, your personal application deadline will fall sometime in October. Or early, yeah, very likely October. Okay. We'll have a full question and answer at the end. So write down your questions so you remember them. This is an application page. Simply what I've done here is to direct you right to the portal where you will register for an account, or if you already have one, you will log in. The CIHR doctoral scholarships are all managed through the ResearchNet portal, and this link will take you to that page. The NSERC doctoral scholarships is, again, it's fully online. I've Sorry, I'm going to go back. I meant to mention that. The CIHR Doctoral Research Awards and Scholarships and the NSERC Doctoral Scholarships application are both full online application programs. 
What, that, what I mean by that is that there is no paper process involved in either one of those. It's a full Polish Bose online application. You're attaching items into your online application. Okay. NSERC doctoral scholarships, those applications are managed in the NSERC online system. The SHRC doctoral scholarships is the exception. It is prepared through a web-based application, and this link takes you to that program. However, you will be instructed to print out and hand in a physical application to your department. It is still very mired in the 20th century. That's, a, that's the only paper process there. Okay, resources. Very important page here. I've given you links to agency resources, so please visit these different, these are relevant pages. Uh, for the CITR doctoral scholarships, they have put together a library of learning resources, and uh, I'm going to put my glasses on here. What you will be very interested in are the instructions to creating your CCCV. Uh, because as if you've had any uh, experience with it, it can be kind of clunky and tricky. Also, the art of writing a CITR application. So please, use the resources that you find here if CITR is your competition. The uh, NSERC, again, puts together uh, videos, uh, video presentations. Again, you'll see there's the application tutorial right there, and it's a postgraduate program summary. Uh, I believe there might be another one down here. Tips on applying for a scholarship or a fellowship and demystifying the review process. A very critical thing to do is to always read the selection committee guidelines for any uh, competition you're involved in. Very, very critical because then you know what the selection committee members have to score in order to be successful. And then Western uh, resources. Be familiar with this by now. If not, bookmark this page. Uh, preparing for competition, we have an enhanced program of strategic scholarship support, and here you'll find today's event. And this is what I was talking about earlier. The register here link will become a presentation link tomorrow, okay, or or Wednesday latest. Okay, so keep checking back here to find that presentation. And then lastly, Research Western. If you have any, uh, any ethics components involved, if you want to check into human ethics or animal ethics, um, again, they have uh, the art of grantsmanship. I recommend you go through that slide deck as well. And there you go. That's it for me. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Peter Simpson, who is going to talk to you about nothing succeeds like success. Hi, and thanks for coming. Uh, you'll see what I mean by nothing su succeeds like success in a few minutes, I think. What prompted this session was some years ago, I used to sit on a committee that uh, worked on nominating faculty members for teaching awards. And the way the committee worked was we would meet and look at the deadlines coming up in the next few months for teaching awards, and we would say, all right, there's the Marilyn Robinson of provincial level teaching award, who can we nominate? And I realized after a while we were doing this backwards. What we should be saying is, here are the people who've won university level teaching awards, what's the next step for the people, you know, to nominate them next for a provincial level award? Or if they won a department level award, let's work on getting them up to a faculty level award. How can we guide them in doing that? So my realization was that what we need to focus on is not the awards, but the people. It's not the racetrack, it's the horses. And so that's why we invited master's level scholarship winners here to talk about doctoral level scholarship. How is a master's different from a PhD? One might naively think it's just twice as much of the same material, but that view won't carry you very far. It's something more than that. As undergraduates, we are absorbers of knowledge that, that, that already exists. And as doctoral students, you transition to becoming creators of knowledge. A master's degree.
history is somewhere in between those two, let's say. We expect you to develop a higher degree of originality, if relevant, and I know these things vary a lot by discipline, to start thinking about knowledge mobilization. If you're in engineering, for example, you might invent a widget, but that's only a widget until you have some plan to turn it into a product. And at a higher level of study, you might be expected to think about that bigger and broader picture. Uh, it's time for you to become a leader and to take initiative of your own. And my point here is that you might well take the strategy, I've won a master's level scholarship, so I have a winning application, and so onward I go with that. I don't want to change anything because I don't want to mess with success. What looks like a great master's level application may not be a winner at the doctoral level because the expected level has changed and also the priorities and emphasis and weighting have changed. confident. You're here at Western. There's 17,000 universities in the world. There's various systems for ranking the world's universities. Western gets different scores in different systems, but they're all around 200. Being in the top 200, we're almost in the top 1%. So you're a doctoral student at one of the top 1 or 2% universities in the world. You must be pretty good. Applying for scholarship is in part getting that quality that got you here down on paper. Looking at the broader picture, you should be asking yourself, what contribution do you want to make here? And it's very easy as a student to get focused on narrow little details and the, you know, the work can be highly technical. Um, there are a huge number of people in the world who are just as smart and hardworking as we are, but they may not have had the same educational opportunities that we have. And so, you know, ask yourself, what can I, what can I do with these advantages that I've got? Henry Ford remarked, you can't build a reputation on what you're planning to do. All of this thought at some point ought to turn into some activity. So some specifics for these applications, this is very important. At the doctoral level, the emphasis and weighting is much more on research and less on grades. And for each particular competition, on the website, you may be able to find some statement about what the priorities are and what the selection committee is looking for. And you should explore that before plotting out your application. Your application will probably be reviewed by people who are in your discipline in the broader sense, but are unlikely to be experts in your little narrow area. So, for example, if you're in biology, your selection committee will include people who are biologists, but if your specific area is the migration behavior of bats, there isn't likely to be anybody on the committee that does that. Plain language. Uh, this is the single biggest failing I've seen in applications I've seen that I didn't think were very good was that I couldn't understand them. And I'm a scientist, so I've only looked at science applications, and I feel like they should be in the least sufficiently yet clear language that, that a scientist from another discipline can make sense of them. You can't just list your accomplishments, you have to explain why they're in I'll tell you a little story to, it, to emphasize that point. In 1842, a philosopher published a book, and in the book he made the statement that we can never ever know anything about what the stars are made of because they're too far away to learn anything about their internal structure and so on. In 1859, so 17 years later, by examining the spectrum of light that comes from the sun, it was uh, comparing to the spectra that you find from elements on Earth. It was proven that the sun is made up of the same elements that you find on Earth, hydrogen and helium and so on. Why am I telling you this? To make the point that the thing that we talk about 
is the result and its importance. I didn't tell you a story about how Fraunhofer built a spectrometer and spent a long time calibrating it. That's not interesting. So there's a phenomenon here that I'm that lacking another name for it. I'm gonna call it Simpson's Rule, and it's this, that when a student communicates about their work, they tend to talk about different elements of the work in proportion to the amount of time they spend on it. And so, you know, go and ask my student in our lab what she's doing and what she's working on, and she'll tell you about calibrating a spectrometer, because that took weeks and weeks. And you really have to push to get more information about, you know, why are you doing this? Why should anyone find this interesting? Remember, you've got to talk about what the sun's made of and why that's interesting not about how you spent a huge amount of time, which you want to talk about because it was a lot of work, calibrating a spectrometer. You've got to explain why it's important and how it'll make an impact. Uh, some more specifics, don't apologize. Uh, to give you an example from my own work in grant applications, I've been working for the last five or six years on building some equipment that's pretty sophisticated. And so in a grant application, I, I'm inclined to say, well, I haven't published a lot in the last five years because I've been building this awful piece of equipment. That's a mistake. The proper thing for me to say is that I have been working on this long-term visionary project for five years, and in the very near future, it will begin to bear fruit. So yeah, everybody has setbacks of various kinds, you know, you were sick for a week or something like that, but it's important in these sorts of applications not to apologize, but to cast all of that in a more constructive language. And again, it's back to Simpson's rule about the amount of time you spend on something. The fact that something took a long time and was kind of frustrating looms large to the person who went through that experience. But to the scholarship selection committee member, they're not so focused on that and they won't notice that, yeah, you seem to have spent a lot of time doing something that wasn't all that productive. Focus on things that were productive, be positive. At the high level of competition, you need to do well in all what the categories are varies with the scholarship. Um, the tri-agency scholarships, it's mostly grades and research at the doctoral level, mostly research. The Vanier, for example, has a very heavy emphasis on leadership. You can't dismiss any of the categories. If you've got a weakness in some area, you've got to make the case for why you should be given the scholarship anyway. You can't assume that being a winner in two out of three It's okay to help your referees who are writing your letter of reference by reminding them of what you've accomplished. Uh, I'll leave that point because Malay will talk a little more about that. This is a painting called White on White by Malevich from 1918. And it doesn't show very well on the screen, but if you look closely, there's a kind of a white square here inside of a larger white square. Why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this to make a point that I want you to remember, which is when you go to an art gallery and look at a painting, there's always a little card next to it telling you something about it. Without the card telling you about this, and this is a very significant and important Without that card, this is just a bunch of white paint. It's nothing. You know, you or I could paint this in 15 minutes, right? But it's an important painting. You know, Rembrandt could have painted it. Rembrandt's a great painter, but he didn't think of it. So where's the accomplishment here? It's not owning a roller and some masking tape and a can of white paint. It's, it's having the idea. What I'm trying to emphasize to you is that we all work in different, very specialized areas, and it's not obvious to me why your work is interesting and vice versa, unless you explain it. Without the background and the context, our work is just a bunch of white paint. 
So I was ruminating on the question of, uh, you know, what can I tell you about how to, how to do well in high-level scholarship applications? Somebody asked a famous record producer, how do you record a great snare drum, a snare drum sound? And his answer was, well, the first step is write a great song. And it occurred to me, and you may think I'm an idiot to tell you this, the first step to being a great scholarship candidate is being a great researcher. And I say research in the broad category and may include all forms of scholarly activity that you might be pursuing. This isn't meant to be uh, sort of science specific. A few thoughts on factors that contribute to that. You need to take responsibility for your own project. You know, as you grow from being an undergrad to being a doctoral student, you take a greater level of initiative and responsibility for where your work is, is going. In, in a similar vein, this is not supposed to be a journey that your supervisor provides a roadmap for and a destination. At some point, partway through the project, you've got to start drawing your own map. Read the literature. This is important for scholarship and grant applications. You've got to show that you've done enough background study to know that what you're doing is novel and how, again, how it fits into a context on, it, on its own. You can't make any claim of novelty. There's got to be some backdrop of literature there. Plan ahead to avoid wasted time. This might be a little bit science specific, but I imagine there's probably examples from other disciplines. Uh, in my own area, often it's the case that, well, I need, to, I need to take some images with an electron microscope. I can't get on the electron microscope for another three weeks because it's a multi-user instrument. Uh, so meanwhile, am I sitting around waiting? No, I've always got a couple of different projects on the go so that I can make good use of my time, knowing that there's always going to be a certain amount of waiting to be done. This is, this is just a form of personal efficiency in your time management. Develop your writing skills. This is very important. It's important not only for scholarships and for your doctoral degree, it's important in the further world of employment, Acad academic or non-academic, very important. Be self-aware and act on your deficiencies. This is perhaps bringing us back to the issue of not apologizing. If you recognize that you're weak in some skill that you need, you may not instantly be able to become better at that skill, but it's good in a scholarship context to show that you're aware of it and that you're taking steps to address it. It shows that you're self-directed. Work hard, yeah, you need to do that to keep up with everyone else who's also working hard, but don't do it in such a way that you burn out. You need to take some time off. That's the end of the slide, so I must be done. Over to Lorraine. Thank you, Peter. That was very insightful. So I'm going to be a little more pragmatic and uh, give you some strategies that I know hold good fruit. I'm not going to tell you the magic, but I'm going to tell you some things about getting the letters of reference that you may uh, not have thought about and would like to encourage you to think about some practices that you might not be naturally inclined to do. So there's a sense when you're thinking about applying for a doctoral scholarship, I think what I'd like to encourage you to do, and really just to just reinforce Peter's first part, what uh, Peter and Paula have said is, make sure you know what's involved in the scholarship. Do that, do some of that research that Paula showed you. And so for example, if you're applying for a shirt doctoral, find out, look at what those links on the web page and find out what all those tips are. Because there's a chance your grad chair and your supervisor will know a lot about the scholarship but there's no guarantee. So unless they call us to ask or they look on their own, it's not bad for you to make sure you know everything that needs to, needs to be done for your scholarship. So take, do a little bit of, apply your research skills to figuring out the scholarship. So then you'll know exactly how the letters of reference are gonna be interpreted, what they're weighted, who they should have, whatever strategies they have there, and then in terms of what I give you here. So if they're gonna ask you some questions about it, you'll be able to answer them. That, that will ease the process. Because often what will happen, and I'm not saying this would be you, but I am a supervisor and I'll get an email from a student, who's a great student of mine, and it will say, I'm applying for this award, can you write me a letter of reference? 
I have a number of students, a lot of, a, a lot of academic responsibilities, my own research, and I'm an administrator. So I say, yes, of course. And then I slot it in. Then what I say, and they may or may not say this to you, but I say, okay, Rachel, please send me everything I need to know to remind me about what I, so I don't forget something so that I can write you the very best letter. And then give me a summary sheet. Lorraine, remember, you know, I read the, I was the one who created the departmental seminar series. I, I have two papers published on my master's in addition to the two that are done for the PhD. I know I can look on the CV and I will pull up the CV to remind myself, but a list of pieces to hi, of highlights so that when I go to write the letter, I don't have to sit there and think, okay, what has she done? What are my files? What's the OGS application I wrote? I have everything right in front of me. If I'm asked to write a letter for somebody I don't know as well, so maybe somebody whose committee I'm going to be on, I will often say, can you come in and talk to me? So that I have context, so I know you, so when I'm writing your letter, I can make you come alive. I can talk about you as a person, I can sense your passion, I can put all the pieces of your accomplishments and your grades into a picture. Because when the committee is reading lots and lots and lots of files, and they're looking at the letters of reference, if they complement each other, reinforce each other, and together create this picture of you as very worthy of this scholarship, that's ideally what you want. You, you want some enthusiasm to come through. You want your, you don't want them to just say, oh, you know, Lorraine, wonderful student, really smart, really good at her research, working on a really important project that looks at this, this, and this. You want them to back everything up with evidence. And so there's a chance that they would be able to do that just because you've been working with them for a number of years. They did masters and PhDs on based on what they know, but, but don't, don't automatically assume that they're gonna have everything at their fingertips. They might plan on writing the letter two days before to give themselves lots of time, and then something could come up at the last minute, and they're like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna have to write it the night before in an hour. Or they could, and so you want to give them as much information as you can so that they can write the best letter that they can. So be very proactive. so everybody else can hear the question. Don't be shy, because I guarantee whatever you're thinking, somebody else wants to know, too. Start a question, excellent. Uh, thanks for the uh, presentation, it was very helpful. Uh, I was just wondering if you could tell me the specifics about what the doctoral scholarships uh, include. I know there's an actual level and is there anything more to the doctoral level? Yeah. I think that's a call. So. Yeah, I, I can probably speak to that. Generally, what you're submitting is a, an application, a complete application form, whether it's web-based or online. You will be required to submit some sort of a one-page or two-page outline of proposed research, because you're applying now for what you're proposing to do next year. Uh, and there are all kinds of guidelines in the resources on how to construct that proposal. Uh, you are going to submit a, a CCCV, a Canadian Common CV, for the most part, and if not, then some sort of free form section that is a record of your research contributions. And again, according to each competition, there are very specific instructions on how you set that up. You will submit academic transcripts. Again, depending on the competition, the instructions may vary as to how you compile them. But across the board, you will be required to submit scans or official transcripts from all universities you've attended even though eligibility may only be looked at in the most recent two years, you are still required to provide 
all of your information transcripts. Okay? And two letters of recommendation. So these are your referees. Uh, they will be submitted for the most part independently of you. Uh, no, that's disregarding what all of the preparation that goes into uh, the, you know, the, what we talked about before, the, the sit down you're gonna have with your referee and all of the information you're going to provide them to write that. But when they actually write the, uh, the reference, they will submit it independently and attach it into your application or hand it in in paper form to the department so that the graduate program coordinator can attach it into your, your application. Okay, okay and, and other than uh, a, a FIPA form, which is a uh, privacy uh, and access to information form that you will have to sign off on and include in your application, there may be a checklist, that's pretty much what's in the bottle which is much the same as what you submitted for a master's application. I heard from a, a couple of PhD students that it's almost impossible to get a shirt for their first year of their PhD. So is that like a, is that like a, a reality? They typically say it's more common in second year to Given, given the importance of research and the need for concrete evidence in research, it's much easier to, to be successful in that kind of competition later in your studies when you can show some publications and you can do some good concrete evidence in the program. So, so it's not impossible in the first year, but I, I would say it's difficult. Uh, we, every year we have one or two uh, more junior scholars who win the four-year fellowship, which covers the first four years of their, their shirt program, their doctoral program. So it is possible, not a lot of them, but every year we have one or two. So. I just want to say, were you, anybody here for the vanity one that we talked that we did last week? So if you heard, the vanity scholarship winner said that she almost didn't apply. Okay, so feeling like I'm not sure I'm gonna, it's worth it and I'm good enough, don't let that stop you because she, every day I'm sure she gets up and says, thank goodness I didn't listen to that voice. Does the review committee, are they concerned at all with the reputation of the person writing their letters? Like is it better to have someone who knows you really well who's a junior or faculty or maybe someone who doesn't know you as well? But so I think you want the best letter that you can get. It's not about the person who's writing the letter, it's about you. So if, uh, so you know, go with who's gonna show your best side forward so that they're not they're not the one who's being who's being considered for the scholarship. Did you, did you want to say something? No, I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. And then remember that your who's reviewing your application might you, you know they might you have the same background but you're not all in the same area. So you might not even know that, that if you read for the person that's the street star in your subset of the area, no one else on the committee might even know that. Another pitfall there too is uh, that if you ask the rock star researcher, the Canada Research Chair, they're being asked to write probably about another 150 letters. If they don't know you very well, their letters may be familiar to selection committee members at the national level, and it's pretty easy for professors to pick up on, I mean, it may read really well to you or I, but to those in the know, they will know after reading that letter
I see your point, but it does seem risky that if you say I'm going to cure all the disease, then you look naive. But I don't think it's a bad thing in an application at this level to express a drive for what you want to accomplish in your entire career with the recognition that you're not going to do all of this in, in the period you choose to do. I think you don't want to talk too much about things that are outside the scope of your current research, but it's not a bad thing, I think, to show that you have a broader vision. Sorry, I don't know those are concrete examples. Maybe, maybe Lorraine has a concrete example. Uh, actually, I just wanted to bring up another point. Uh, Canadian government, through these programs, are, are, are supporting scholars who network. So I. I didn't mention the Vanier Scholars as part of this, the scholarships, because the Vanier program in particular is a very high level, very prestigious doctoral scholarship uh, competition, but it, it, it's designed by the Canadian government to really be about rewarding scholars who move with the research and don't stay at the same university. So and they're all about mobile scholars, so on that theme, if your research is international in scope, if you've had international uh, study abroad experience uh, uh, you know, that, that, that's involved with your research, make sure that you make your letter writers aware of that. Make sure that you're drawing on that in your application. Some of you would have received this morning the reminder that the Michael Smith Foreign Study Supplements competition is on for the fall now. As Canada graduate scholars, some of you will be eligible to apply for money to go abroad to do research. Uh, so again, all of this uh, goes to demonstrate that you are a networker and a mover and a shaker, and that is what the Canadian government identifies as a highly qualified person don't underestimate how good you are and be uh, realistic. So don't over talk how wonderful you are. People can smell that, but don't under underestimate it. And so that was what came out last week too. You know, if you're wondering just, you know, are these really good or not good, talk to someone you trust. And I want to just, you know, say what Peter had said at the very beginning. You're here. You know, you're, you're, you're good enough to put in a really Competitive application and in, you know m and get the scholarship. You know, so give it your best shot because we love it when you get the scholarships. So and they will be reviewed. We take this really seriously. So you know they they could be reviewed at the department level. They'll be reviewed at the level of SPPS, and then they're evaluated and sent forward. So the, so and remember the deadline September. And I know it seems like it's the hot and sleepy July eleventh. And I'm really big on living in the moment, but I'm also really pragmatic. It's not too early to get started on doing your homework. That way you're not going to be like hard and pounding, you know, uh, at the last minute, doing it really in an enjoyable and enjoyable way. But I think getting started now is going to make you more competitive. That reminds me too of another uh, resource that we've teed up are the writing workshops. So you're welcome to sign up. We don't have the registration links ready yet, but there will be a dedicated writing workshop for CIHR, Health and Medical Research applicants, scholarship applicants, in early August. Uh, the next one will be for natural science and engineering applicants, another writing workshop, and then uh, we'll round that off with one dedicated to social science and humanities uh, scholars who will be applying in that for scholarship competition. Uh, we've also teed up uh, writing workshops that are sort of the rudimentary uh, writing workshops 101 for those uh, who are senior undergrads or first year master's scholars who want sort of the, 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 the basics again on how to approach the search the third search which you guys are all here all time right now so check that page the preparing for competition page because and, and mark your uh, phone calendars uh, with those dates as they approach. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I know this is a uh, 
I can answer that question. So the question was, uh, are the awards at the doctoral level allocated to the universities by the government similar to the CGS and master's operations? No. It runs on a holding system for the most part. Now, I have to back up a bit. The CIHR doctoral scholarships competition is pretty much a direct to agency application right. So we sort of insert ourselves into the operation only to offer review and, and feedback for revision only. So if you apply, you're eligible, you'll go to the national competition. NSERC and SHRC doctoral scholarship competitions operate on a quota system. And what a quota is, it's not an allocation of awards, it's a quota, an allowable number of applications that are allowed um, to be submitted to the national competition by the university. And those quotas are set by certain formulas based on that. So that three year uh, average of success, most recent few years, it's a rolling average and then it's multiplied by a factor of research productivity on the campus comes into play there too. So universities are each allowed to submit a quota of applications. We don't know yet what our quotas are for the NSERC and SHRC doctoral scholarship competitions. Last year for SHRC was around 84, and for NSERC, 55, 60, 55, um, don't quote me. But a consequence of having that uh, quota of applications per university is that the applications are evaluated at the university level to choose which to go forward. And if you want to know more details of that, Paul, I think you're in the room. And, and don't forget, if you have any questions whatsoever, you've got my email, you probably can inundate it now by, by messages from me, but, but, but use my email if you have any questions whatsoever. Uh, typically, your graduate program is your first sort of line of input, uh, direct your inquiries to them, just for you to be time sensitive if you need an answer right away. Uh, but, but if they don't have the answer,